October 31, 1517, is when um, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis on the war door of the uh, Wittenberg Church. I don't know if any of you have been to that uh, church, but I have. And I have seen where he nailed that on. I, the nail holes still aren't there, but anyway, that's where he was. I really believe that many of the teachings of the, um, came out of the Protestant Reformation have been lost today. You say, well, how can that happen? And I really believe that we owe a great debt to these courageous men and women who stood firm during great opposition to what they believed. In fact, the teachings that they revived from the Reformation, these Christians have given them to us, the five solas, sola scriptura, scripture, and scripture alone. Solus Christus, Christ and him alone. Solo gracious, grace alone. And sola fide, faith alone. And sola Deo, gloria, it all goes to glory to the God only. Glory to God only. These are the five solas that came out of the Protestant Reformation that I'm going to take you on a journey this fall, right up to October 31st, and we are going to cover each one of these topics and try to revive these not only in your own life, but also in the lives of those you come in contact with. Turn with me, if you would, to the Gospel of John uh, 18, verse, chapter 18, verse 33 through 38 is the story of Jesus' trials. He had gone to the high priest Caiaphas, and now he was sent to the Roman governor Pontius Pilate because only Rome could kill people. The Pharisees and Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, had already declared that he deserved death, but they could not make that happen. It was only the Romans that could do that, and so they sent Jesus to Pontius Pilate. I'd like to take this, chapter 18, and read this through. Follow me, if you will. 33, verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? This conversation that goes on between Jesus and Pilate Pilate knew nothing about the Hebrew scriptures and had really could care less. But here he was in the front of the person that the Bible declares is the word, the word of God. And so he has this conversation with this, with this person that he doesn't really know anything about, but I can, you can tell that he is very much impressed with Jesus. Because Jesus says, do you say this on your own accord, or do others say it to you about me? One of the things that I, we were learning, Gary, last week, is whenever anyone, it's, it's the important thing, is Jesus did it all the time. He asked questions. You're not going to learn anything unless you ask questions. And Jesus does, does that. And he wants to know from Pilate, is this something that uh, you are really interested in, or is this just something that you have to go through because you're the governor? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? He says, what do I care? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting and that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. This must have impressed Jesus, uh, Pilate because then he says, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. 
For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And then Pilate asks the question, I think from a deepness in his heart, what is truth? What is truth? truth. Quite frankly, I think that all of us in here could ask the same question, couldn't we? What is truth? How do we know? We get all kinds of information because of our information age. In fact, most people say if it's on the internet, it's what? Okay. The point is, is that no one really knows or at least they're asking the question, what is truth? What is true? I mean, I watch CNN or I watch Fox News. I watch all these channels and they tell me this is what's going on in Texas. Do I know this is going on in Texas? I have not, I'm not there. I have to trust them as an authority to know that these things and events are happening. What is truth? He asked that question to Jesus because I really think that he believed he wanted to know, but then when he didn't wait for Jesus' answer. And I believe that Jesus would have given him an answer, but he didn't want to know the truth. And quite frankly, before Jesus comes, you either love the truth, or you don't. And Adam, I mean, and uh, Pilate said, what is truth? But then he was afraid to know what is truth. You know, the truth is a little scary at times, isn't it? But does that change it? Just because you're afraid to know the truth, does it change the truth? Right? So, who can you believe today? Who can you trust? We live in a culture today where the Bible is no longer the authority it was before. Did you know that? Have you noticed that? That the Bible is not the authority that it used to be in our culture here in America. Today there are people, most people feel like the Bible is a good piece of literature. But written by men only. It's no different than any other inspirational book. And some even believe that the stories are just myth. Some even believe it is the cause of many of our problems today in our culture. I'm talking about here in America. People believe it is the Bible that has caused most of our problems today. But everyone, I want you to know... I have seen this change in the last, just the last 15 years. I've been a pastor for 36 years. Used to be when I came into a church that I had some authority, Gary. <laughs> people listened to you. And when you spoke, people jumped up. The issue is, is that that authority is not in society today for most pastors and most clergy is gone. And the Bible as their authority or backup is, is, that, is that people just don't rely on it as an authority anymore. How many of you have noticed that at all? If you're communicating with people around you at all in this world, in this culture, which you should be as Christians, we're the salt of the earth, the light of the world, you should be associating with people all around. You should know what they're thinking, what they're saying. And you would realize that for most people, the Bible has lost its authority. But I want you to know that everyone in this room Everyone in this community, everyone in this country, everyone in the world has an authority. They have an authority, 
uh, that what they build their system of beliefs and their worldview on. It is their trusted source for information. Right? Everybody has an authority that they trust or they wouldn't be able to formulate some kind of worldview and that they do and they do. My prayer and hope is that everybody in this room has chosen this as their authority. But not everybody in your community, in your neighborhood, or even in your family would believe that. In this information age, there are many voices, right? There's a lot of opinions out there. So how do you know what is true and what isn't? Jesus said these words that are recorded in the Bible. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He also said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He said that the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. And as he prayed to his heavenly Father, he asked his Father that he would sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Jesus accepted the Old Testament, my friends. The Old Testament was the only scripture he had, but he accepted it. And if you follow Jesus and you love Jesus, Jesus put his mark of approval on the scriptures. That the Old Testament was the scripture of the time and it had authority in his life for he said to the devil, it is what? Written. In fact, the Bible tells us, John, the Apostle John, writes these words in John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory is the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and what? Truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the Word. When we talk about the Word of God, Jesus is God's thought, as someone put it, made audible. God's thought, his thoughts made audible so that we might understand the life of Jesus. The Bible is for not so much for what we know. The Bible is not so much that we can gain a bunch of knowledge. It is not what you know, but who you know. The stories here are in this word are to, de- to tell us about God, who he's really like. Here are some amazing facts about the Bible. Did you know that according to the Guinness Book of World Records, that it is the best-selling distributed book in all the, in all, of all time. Over five billion copies have been printed and distributed. Five billion. You know what's sad about that? Is that you and I have several Bibles in our home. But guess what? There's seven billion people in the world. That means there's some people, at least two billion, that don't have Bibles. You know, it also, the Bible was written over 1,600 years, from 1,500 B.C. to 100 A.D. There are actually, it's a library, 66 books in this library, written by 40 different men with varied occupations. In fact, those occupations, some of those are listed here. Prophets, priests, shepherds, fishermen, kings, doctor, scholars, accountant, tent maker. The list goes on. What do they have in common? The Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible says that it claims to be the Word of God. All Scripture is breathed. How much? 
All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every, every good work. And 2 Peter 1.21 says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. My friends, Scripture is the revelation about Jesus. It's the truth about God and His work for your salvation. But someone may ask, well, how was the Bible formed? You know, as you work, go to people and you talk to people about your authority is the Bible, and they question that. It's an old book you have to dust off, and it's so old, it's so irrelevant today. So how are you going to answer people like that? Well, I want you to know that the best way to do that is, first of all, is to share your own testimony, what the Bible has done for you, that has brought you comfort. That, it, that the promises you've claimed in the Bible have come true. That's the way that you answer those kinds of things. This book was put together. In fact, by the time of Christ, we call it, when the Bible was put together, it was called canonization. The Bible, the Old Testament, was already put together, canonized as we would call it, by the time Jesus was here. In other words, the Jewish scholars, the Jewish priests, and all of the people who were authorities when it comes to Scripture looked at the Old Testament, looked at all the different writings, and formulated the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Because Jesus identifies those three as what makes up the Old Testament. And so he gave and stamped his, his uh, acceptance of the Old Testament. Now, these men who got together and they put these books together had some criteria, such as authenticity. Were they written by the person that they claimed to be written by? And also, did they fit into the scriptural um, teachings of other books? Did they come together? These criteria also were the same way that the New Testament was created by after uh, the last apostle died some years later, the Christian leaders of the church started formulating and putting together the New Testament and with the same kind of criteria. A lot of people don't know how that, because I people ask me, well, how did the Bible, how do you know, how, how was it put together? Well, there were people, knowledgeable people at those days. I can't tell you if the book of Judas should be in the Bible or not, but those people back then could tell you whether it was authentic or not. And quite frankly, some of that's why they call them the apocryphal writings. Okay? Anybody heard of the apocrypha before? The apocryphal writings. They may be good literature. They may be good books. They may be good historical books. But the people in that day, and quite frankly, I would trust people in the day that it was put together than people today to know that that was right. Because today we can use anything. But back then they put it together because they knew what was authentic and what wasn't. The thing that uh, I do know is that the Bible has survived the test of time. Amen? Amen? This book should have been long gone by now, right? But it has come and tested through time. In fact, the Bible has been miraculously preserved. And it has always continued to be a reliable source through archaeology and science to be proven over and over again to be a reliable source of information and truth. And one of the greatest evidences of this book is how it has changed people's lives, including mine. This book has power. The power of the everlasting God is in these pages. And it changes people because it is a revelation of his character. I tell you, in 1946, 47, there was a little shepherd boy that was playing outside of 
a place called Qumran, near the northern end of the Dead Sea. In the Dead Sea area, there's very dry, and there's a lot of cave in the lime, caves in the limestone there, and he was herding his sheep, and he was throwing some rocks into these caves when he heard some pottery chatter. So he decided to go check it out, and when he in there, he saw hundreds of pots in this cave. And of course, his father came and looked at some of the manuscripts that were stored in these uh, pots, and uh, thought they might be important, and so he brought some archaeologists. They came in on the scene to discover that there were thousands of these clay pottery with, with thousands of manuscripts that were written before the time of Jesus, and they were scriptures. The whole book of Isaiah was found and discovered in complete form in those, pot, in those pots, the whole book of Isaiah. And so they decided, you know, if we have discovered this in 1946, this is 2,000 years later, these are the earliest manuscripts that we have. Let's check out, you know, because it used to be they had scribes that would uh, copy and when you have people copying copies and copying copies, what do you get? It's kind of like the rumor game, right? You're going to have some error. But do you know that they discovered, and it's on display now, and I've seen those, that manuscript of Isaiah. It is in the, in the museum there. You can see it, and you can read it if you can read Hebrew. You can read it for yourself. That there has hardly, over 2,000 years, there is not a bit of change from what it was there to what it is today and what we have. We can have confidence that God has preserved his word over the years. But there is one thing that the devil hates, and that's his book. In fact, after the apostles and years later, he tried to destroy this book. And one of the things that it started happening in the time of Jesus, and it happens today, is that tradition is taking the place of Scripture. You know, when I was, I had a conversation, I put on my um, church in Wilmington, Delaware, I put a, just a, a, a question, what day is the Sabbath day? Just get people thinking about it. Put that on my the billboard there, and then I, uh, then I, I got a phone, or actually it was a, I put my email address on there, anyway, I got a response, this was a, a, a Catholic friend of mine, we became friends on, online, and we just started emailing back and forth, and uh, he began to talk about how Sunday was the Sabbath day, and well, I responded, and I said, well, according to the Bible, it's the seventh day, not the first day, and we went back and forth. In a very good uh, way of communicating, we were friends the whole time. We weren't just fighting about which day was right and what, but we the principles of the Sabbath, and as we went through that together, one of the things that I noticed that was different was that when he would give his arguments, his authority was church fathers or church tradition or what and mine was the bible and i had no other source of, of of authority or information it was just coming from the bible and i noticed that we were not going to get anywhere because his authority was different than mine so what is your authority how the bible was replaced by how was the Bible replaced by tradition? The Bible was to keep God's people from being deceived. But many years after the apostles, the church believed that the Bible was was a dangerous thing in the hands of the people because in their uneducated minds they would interpret it wrong and then be deceived. So the church then kept the Bible locked away by language and availability, and they said to the people that they would interpret the Bible for them. I'll tell you what it means. It's just like for me, taking all the Bibles here, locking them up, and telling you, 
I'm the only one as your pastor that can tell you what it means because you don't have the experience and education that I do, so you may be led astray because of your, your, you don't have the knowledge that I do. So I will tell you what it says and expect you to believe. How's that working for you, pastor? This is when men began to replace the Bible with tradition. And it began in the time of Jesus. In other words, the law, the prophets, and the uh, Psalms was not enough for the Jewish people in Christ's day. They had to have the Mishnah, and they had to have all these other. In fact, for the Sabbath, remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, six days shalt thou labor. Well, that wasn't enough. They had to have... Uh, you know, thousands of other uh, laws so that you would make sure that you kept the Sabbath the way you're supposed to. Sound familiar? Jesus said this to the, the Pharisees, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. This is what happened, is that tradition took the place of the Word of God. And that is the tactic the devil used in the early, early church. And that leads us to a time that the history calls the Dark Ages. Why is it called the Dark Ages? Because the Bible was not available to the common people. In fact, the Bible was outlawed. You couldn't own a Bible. It was illegal. But God preserved his word through the people who made it their life work to preserve it. People like the Waldensian Christians in the Alps of Europe would copy manuscripts of the Bible and distribute them in the language of the people. And pastors would preach from these manuscripts of the Bible at the risk of their life. That takes me to the... To the Life of Martin Luther, which we will refer to several times in our series. Martin Luther found uh, in his early life, his dad wanted him to be a lawyer. But because of his conviction, he decided that he would become a monk. Which his father did not like, and for two years they were apart, never communicating because of that. But Luther kept in his mind, as he was at the monastery there, and uh, in fact, he says these words, if anybody could earn salvation by being a monk, I was the monkiest of them all. <laughs> in fact, he went into the monastery, and there in the monastery, he found the scriptures. It was in Latin, but he was learning Latin. And there it was, chained to the wall. I guess because they were afraid somebody might steal it, I guess. I don't know. It was chained to the wall. And so he made it his point every day to go and hung. He just hungered and thirsted after the Bible. And he wanted to read it over and over. And he did. And he became, it became his authority in his life. In fact... In Great Controversy, it says he firmly declared that the Christians should receive no other doctrines than those which rest on the authority of sacred scripture. These words struck at the very foundation of papal supremacy, tradition over scripture. They contain the vital principle of the Reformation. Oftentimes, Martin Luther is called the... Um, the forerunner or the, of, the, of the Reformation, but the Reformation was already in full gear by the time Martin Luther came along. Little did he realize, John Huss, Jerome, Calvin, many of these people were contemporaries of Luther as well. God was doing a mighty thing, and guess what? These men began to write the Bible and translate it into the language of the people. In fact, Luther himself, when he was hid away in the Wartburg Castle, there he was. And in those months that he was uh, 
prisoner in that castle, he wrote and translated the Bible from Latin into Germany. In fact, the German language today comes from his translation of the Bible. That's what they speak today in Germany. Martin Luther was living pretty dangerously. But before church and government councils, as they attacked his writings and his works about the Bible and about grace and about his Savior Jesus, he was brought before church uh, officials, government officials. They were attacking his writings, but he always said to them, show me my heir from the Bible, and I will be the first to throw my works in the flames. The Reformation said that the Bible and the Bible alone is the only authority for Christian practice and doctrine. Sola Scriptura. Sola Scriptura. In fact, that's the reason why the Bible today is so needed by people. I think one of the things that uh, oftentimes um, we do is we forget how important the Bible is to us and how many people risked their lives so that we could have it today. How many hundreds and thousands of martyrs went through to, to make sure that we had the Bible today for us? And even though we live in a culture where the Bible does not have the authority that it may have used to, it should in a Christian's life. The Bible and the Bible alone should be the only test of our faith and our teachings. And these men made sure that it could happen. Men and women of the Reformation who gave their lives so that we have it. They hungered and thirsted after the Bible. And I think about it, even in this today and age where the culture is that way, you have what they're looking for. When people look at your lives, is the Bible your authority? Is it how you live? Because one of the things is, is that people today are questioning that authority. But they can't question how you live. And when people ask you, you can say, it's because of this book that I've learned the truth about Jesus. It is through this book that I've learned the truth about God. And that, my friend, is how the Bible says God will sanctify us, is through his word. My friends, it is up to us. Who is your authority? What is your authority? Is the Bible and the Bible alone your authority? Don't take this book for granted. You may have five or six Bibles in your house or whatever, but don't take it for granted. Spend time in this book because this book changes not only history, but it changes your life and those lives around you. Sola Scriptura, the Bible, and the Bible alone. Let's sing our closing hymn together. And if it's your desire to make the Bible again your authority, let's sing this last song, number 272. Stand with me if you would.
Our Heavenly Father, it is so, we are so grateful that you have preserved your word to this very day. And I pray, Lord, that we will not take it for granted those who made it possible, who gave their life so that we might have it today. We pray, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts through your word and that we may know Jesus because of it. We pray it in his name. Help us to live. Help us to live the Bible. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 